Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking and Nara Lokesh, it's really a pleasure to have you on the show for the first time um, on the occasion of your government completing 100 days uh, in power. How does the IT, Electronics and Communication Minister of uh, the Andhra government feel in terms of the distance covered in these 100 days? First off, thank you very much for having me. No, I think the first 100 days was all about restoring confidence back in Andhra Pradesh. In the last five years, we suffered a lot. You know, PPAs were unilaterally cancelled. A lot of decisions were taken which were against the interests of uh, businessmen and also interests of the state. So restoring confidence was our first focus and we've been able to do that in the first 100 days. And you've seen quite a few investments have already been announced and lined up for the state. So quite exciting times ahead. So, so let me ask you, Nara Lokesh, you know, as Gen Next in politics, uh, the run-up to elections, the Pad Yatras, how, how did you prepare for those elections in the summers of 2024? Um, you know, what were, what were you thinking at that time? And uh, were, you, were you confident that you and your party would be in a position to form the government? First of all, I'm a Stanford MBA. And that I believe was important for business. And if you want to emerge as a leader in India, you have to do a padyatra. And the reason I say that is day in, day out, you need to be in public. You need to understand the problems. And once you internalize it, you'll be able to come up with solutions to solve the problems. So the padyatra transformed me fundamentally in that perspective. To run up to the padyatra itself, I clearly stated that TDP will form the next government. And no second thoughts about it. And if you've seen a month into my Padhyatra... That we was the, wishful thinking or confidence? The confidence. Because everyone in the state was suppressed. No one could speak. We did not have democracy. False cases were foisted against all of us. 23 cases against me. I have an attempt to murder case now against me. I have an SCST case, false case foisted against me. See, all of us were suppressed. F false cases were foisted against everyone. Some of them were even sent to jail. But, you know, we believed in our resolve. And we were confident that people of Andhra Pradesh will not accept this kind of government. How did uh, you find uh, people, uh, you know, the chemistry with people when you met them on the ground, acceptability? Was it because your father's been a popular man, but he's also lost elections, and that's the rough and tumble of politics. But when you stepped out, what was it like for somebody from Stanford going down uh, to ground level politics? What was it all about for you? Stanford was about India, Padhyatra was about Bharat. So I think it was a great experience for me. Uh, I, I was able to understand public issues far better. And all that, we were able to crystallize it well and bring it part of a manifesto. A great example of that was I met a woman who was making bhajis on the roadside. So during my Padhyatra, I stopped next to her, I sat next to her, I spoke to her. And I asked her, what do you want from the government? She said, I have two kids, just get them jobs. She said uh, she spent 30 years of her life making bhajis there, saving every rupee. And she's a widow. Every rupee. She educated both of her kids. Now that they graduated, they don't have jobs. So she said that's the only thing that she expects from the new government. And if you look at our six promises that we made, uh, our first promise is to create 20 lakh jobs. And interactions like these uh, reinforced that job creation should be our first and singular priority as a government. Uh, jobs important and it's something that uh, is a harsh reality across the country. Not enough jobs and lot of youngsters looking for jobs. Uh, uh, but six promises. Let me, let me ask you on the six promises. State finances uh, right now not in the uh, best of uh, situation. The white paper released by your government shows about a lakh and a half crore uh, revenue deficit. Um, and, and almost uh, the GSDP, which has been reduced, uh, your white paper says uh, that lack of growth has costed uh, loss of about 7 lakh crore. So how do you fulfill promises in this uh, kind of a dire financial situation? I mean, if you look at it, Mr. Naidu has amazing experience in this. In '95, when he became the chief minister, the situation was the same. He balanced both welfare and development. We are known for it. So we are going to do huge capital investments, number one. Number two, a lot of uh, industrialists are actually looking at investing in Andhra Pradesh and that will automatically kickstart our entire economic engine. 
our entire job creation will kickstart our economic engine, which will then help us fund our welfare promises. So we believe in the importance of balancing both welfare and development. So uh, as far as investments are concerned, uh, first 100 days, what's the report card? Well, we got TCS, Lulu is back. We have uh, huge commitments in the renewable energy sector, 72 gigawatts of renewable energy in the next five years. So that's phase one. Then we're going to, you're going to see a lot of investments coming in petrochem, uh, in uh, universities, in electronics manufacturing, in the IT space, in the pharma space over the next 100 days. You even put out a tweet in April uh, 2024, I think ahead of the elections, uh, when you tagged Elon Musk. Any conversations going on there? Well, if things go well, you should hear about it uh, as and when they decide to come to India. As and when they decide, uh, you're not giving much away and I'm somebody uh, who always wants to know what's really going on and the show is called Frankly Speaking. So the onus is on you to be frank on where you are in these conversations. See, if you look at it, uh, our, as state government and as Telugu Desam Party government, uh, We've been having conversations with Tesla way back uh, since 2015. Mr. Naidu met Elon Musk way back then. And the conversations continued, even out of power. End of the day, we have love for our own state. In power, out of power, will continue to support our state, promote our state. So those conversations continue to happen. But it is for them to decide when they want to come to India, how they want to come to India, and which form they want to come to India. So I don't think I should so let's preempt So let me be specific. Uh, since you have uh, assumed power, uh, and in the last hundred days, have there been conversations and uh, are, we, are we looking at some positive development, some movement forward? You will see it across sectors. There have been amazing I'm conversations across sectors. I'm speaking of uh, Elon Musk and that conversation first among other conversations which I want you to uh, describe. So, continue to have conversations. See, end of the day, it will be unfair on my part to jump the gun on this. But definitely Andhra Pradesh is among the top three investment destinations now in India. And we it's not just about ease of doing business, it's going to be about speed of doing business. And this is the promise I've been giving to everyone and we're going to deliver on that promise. Okay, so Nara Lokesh, let me, let me also ask you, there have been challenges in the first hundred days and the Vijayawada uh, floods uh, uh, were, were a case in point. The manner in which we saw you and Mr. Naidu, you know, on ground zero, it was almost as if he was a man possessed. I mean, that's the sense of urgency one got to see uh, as far as the visuals are concerned. Uh, what really happened? And, and, and the call that you gave for startups to come forward, uh, to give technical solutions and use technology to uh, help solve a few problems, uh, give us a sense of what really was going on behind the scenes. I mean, if you look at the floods, it was one in 248 year event. So it's once in two centuries that we had that kind of water come in. And areas were completely inundated with six, seven, foot, seven feet of water. So, and there was water flowing through that area. So even boats to go in, rescue, give basic relief, we found it extremely challenging. So when we, when we realized this, it was very important for us to use the best of technology available out there to deliver relief. And that's what we've done. And then subsequently we used a sandbox mechanism to work on how do we give focus on rehabilitation. So 15 days after the flood, uh, you know, we were able to uh, deliver on the relief. 15 days later we did the entire rehabilitation bit. Almost 650 crores of money was actually sent to the bank accounts without any fanfare on a humanitarian ground. And all this we were able to do because we did the sandbox, we had the technology in place. You know, we, we used drones. I mean, it's a pilot. I wouldn't say that we solved the problem. It's a pilot, we had 40 drones that were working 24 hours actually delivering food to the rooftops of various houses. And, I and it worked? It. it worked. 50,000 houses got food delivered. It did work. I wish I had 2,000 drones. So that's one thing we've taken up as a task that we will get 2,000 drones for the agriculture sector that you know, farmers can use, farmers' children can uberize those drones and use them for f the farming sector. And then when there is any emergency, we can pull it out and deliver food using drones. Come again, come again, you, you use the word Uberize those drones. So are we going to have drone cabs, <laughs> literally speaking, uh, which will be used uh, for various sectors? 
No, the idea was that uh, there's no point of every farmer buying a drone. So we can have a group of farmers buy a drone, could be the farmer's son, train him, get him you know, through various subsidies, give him a drone. And then the farmers can have an app on when they want any spraying to be done or any crop assessment to be done. They can just push a button and then you know, they can get the entrepreneur to come and fly a drone on them. And the pricing can be very transparent. And this is something we're actually working with the agriculture ministry now. Amazing. And uh, is that what brings you to uh, Delhi? Uh, you're here. You're part of the national government. Did you, did you actually at that stage uh, think uh, that you would not only win the state of Andhra Pradesh, but also have a say uh, in, in the Lok Sabha, in the formation of uh, the government at the center? No, our support to the Honorable Prime Minister has been unconditional. If you look at it, we joined the NDA unconditionally. We continue to support NDA unconditionally. The single reason for this is we believe in the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister. We are here to support. We are here to uh, create Vikasit Bharat. And we believe as a state, Andhra Pradesh has an important role to play. So I think together we have a lethal combination in that sense. And these conversations, relationship... Uh, tell me, tell me about your first meeting with the Prime Minister. I was very fortunate uh, to meet the Honorable Prime Minister during a rally. And I made certain promises to the Prime Minister in terms of the number of seats we'll, we will win. And, and were you on target? I was off by one seat. One seat? One seat. I was off by one seat. And I did apologize to the Prime Minister for not delivering that one, that seat. one seat. Okay, so, so you told him 17 and delivered 16. No, I, I promised minimum 22. And we delivered 21. 21. <laughs> okay. So 21 uh, seats uh, as, as the promise that you uh, delivered. And uh, uh, how, did, how did you find uh, the Prime Minister? Because, uh, you know, the, the relationship hasn't been good all along. And just ahead of elections, these conversations started again. And uh, finally, the alliance happened. Uh, were you part of those huddles that were happening uh, with the BJP? And, and how did you find the Prime Minister when he engaged with both you and Mr. Naidu? I mean, the experience has been amazing. His love for the state and the nation cannot be questioned. He's very clear. His commitments are very clear. And he wants next generation leadership also to come to the forefront and create jobs. And that's been his single mandate to all of us, is create jobs, take the nation forward. So it's been an amazing experience so far. And Going forward also, uh, we will continue to support uh, the way we have in the last 120 days. But uh, you are you're constantly wooed by the other side as well. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a bit less now, but it was a lot, uh, you know, in the uh, just uh, weeks following the election results. Uh, at any time, uh, did you feel that, uh, you know, you were being wooed both sides and, uh, you know, you could weigh your options? No, as I said, our support is unconditional. So when we make a promise, we stand by it. No second thoughts about it. And uh, as soon as, I think two hours into polling, both the Honorable Chief Minister and Honorable Prime Minister had a conversation saying that, you know, we're f congratulations, we're going to form the next government, both at the state and at the center. So it, it was an amazing relationship in that sense. And we'll continue to maintain that. So let me, let me ask you, in the recent budget, uh, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman promised 15,000 crores for the state of Andhra, uh, especially the dream project of uh, making Amravati uh, the capital of Andhra. Mr. Naidu developed Hyderabad, made it uh, you know, the destination for foreign investment and an alternative to Bengaluru uh, for IT. Uh, what are the plans for Amravati? So Amravati will be our knowledge city. You already see a lot of universities already operating out of there. You'll see more institutions coming in. The uh, entire ecosystem will get built out of there. But Mr. Naidu has been saying this again and again that as a capital, we'll have a single capital, but development will be decentralized. So that's how Kia came to Anantapur, which is one of India's most backward district. It was pre-Kia. Now all the renewable energy projects are going to a district called Karnul. All the electronics manufacturing are going to a different district. So we have a very clear sectoral focus of what investments will go to which district and how do we create the entire ecosystem. So the ministers are clear. Uh, you know, the HRD ministry is clear on what we need to deliver for that district, what kind of training, what kind of skilling we need to do. So with that clarity of thought, we're going about exe executing our vision of decentralized development. Was this blueprint already ready uh, even before elections? No, we started implementing it since 2014. 
that's how Kia came to Anantapur. Renewable Energy came to uh, Karnul. All the, the, one of the world's largest TV panel manufacturer, TCL, came to Tirupati because we had that focus. Aqua, Andhra is now number one, not in India but in the world, for the single reason that that's, that's the kind of thrust we have given. And North Andhra, which is Vishakhapatnam, will have your entire defense, IT, uh, you know, chemical and pharma, and your medical devices manufacturing clusters. And we're going about systematically planning that entire ecosystem. Out. So the blueprint was there. We partially executed on it in the first five years of our government. And now we will de definitely take it to a logical conclusion. And um, any, any changes that you've made to the blueprint, uh, you know, to bring it up to speed uh, to the requirements and uh, the possibilities uh, of, of 2024 I think the biggest and beyond? Thing, no, I think the biggest thing now we are seeing is investments are cutting across sectors. So investors no longer just invest in a data center, but they want to invest in the entire green energy ecosystem. So there is a need to have a singular desk that cuts across ministers and ministries. So that's where we revived the entire old economic development board model, uh, headed by a young IS officer. But everyone under him are th these uh, IIT, IIMs, youngsters who, who have experience in investment promotion. We're bringing the entire team together to not only pro uh, promote and attract new investments, but also to ensure that existing investors double down into Andhra Pradesh. Because in the past five years, we lost our own investors who already invested in the state, went to other states. So we want to give them that comfort, that trust factor, and have them invest their next rupee of expansion in Andhra Pradesh. So let me, let me ask you, you're not even in the top 10 states as far as FDI is concerned. That's the challenge uh, for Andhra now. Plus, you have competition coming in from Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, you've also got competition coming in from Telangana. So what is uh, the plan uh, for the TDP government, uh, for uh, Chandrababu Naidu and Nara Lokesh, uh, you know, personally, uh, the vision that they have to meet these challenges? Speed of doing business. Because today, all the investments done are mega investments, north of a billion dollars. And different companies have had different experiences with other states. So what they're requesting us is if you promise on X date, give, please give it to us on X date. And I'm saying I'll do X minus one. I'll, I'll do it better. For that, we're gearing the entire ecosystem to deliver on this promise. And just give us a year. We'll be among the top three states in FDI investments. What happens to promises made? Because we've seen the Telangana and the Karnataka experiences. They're struggling uh, with their state finances. They've made promises, so-called freebies. Uh, and... Uh, you know, they are unable to deliver on the promises given the state of finances. How will you avoid falling into that trap? See, already out of the six promises, we have started delivering on a first promise which is creation of jobs. Pension has been increased. The Anna canteens which are meant to feed the marginalized is restarted. And we have a clear roadmap on which month, which promise will be rolled out in a very systematic manner, keeping in mind the state finances. So we have a clear action plan, saying that if economic activity kickstarts, and as and when the economic activity kickstarts, it will generate income for the state. It will generate revenues for the state. Plus you have an ATM sitting in New Delhi, because uh, that's how uh, coalition governments have run in the past, which is uh, partners uh, in the coalition put pressure on the center and the ATM gives money. Is that also a model I think that, that is a works? very unfair analogy to call the central government an ATM. But we, it's worked we, like that no, in no, the past. We are, why, we, why should anybody believe that it's different? No, no, we are a responsible uh, partner of India and we're all citizens of India. That's very, very important. And as a nation, we need to grow. See, if you look at historically, the bifurcation of Andhra Pradesh was against the interest of the people of Andhra Pradesh. It's very clear because we, lo we, we were to lose a capital city called Hyderabad. It's a great loss. So there were certain provisions made, certain promises made to Andhra Pradesh. And I would appeal to all other states to look at Andhra Pradesh in that context. Because we, we need a handholding, we need help. So that two years later, we will contribute to national building. We've done that in the past. We've done that with Hyderabad. Under Vajpayee Ji's leadership, that's exactly what Hyderabad uh, got a certain advantages. And then look at Hyderabad today. It's contributing to the nation. And we have the expertise and we will do that all over again under the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister and Mr. Naidu. So let me, let me ask you, I, I belong to the generation of reporters 
who has uh, followed uh, the reform man, the original reform man, Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu, the power sector reforms. For the first time, distribution being privatized to cut losses, bills being sent to people. We've seen on the ground all of that happening in erstwhile united Andhra Pradesh. And I've been on the ground with him, um, I think in the years 96, 97, 98, uh, in, in that era. And he was called the reform man, the IT man uh, that India had in terms of governance through IT. What does uh, Nara Lokesh uh, see for himself in terms of, uh, you know, the kind of name you will make for yourself? What kind uh, of a guy will you be for a politician in Gen Next? Well, I hope that after m the legacy that I would love to leave behind is a job creator. This is what I believe in. I believe India needs next generation leaders who will create jobs. If you look at various other economies and societies, they don't celebrate wealth, but they celebrate the number of jobs they've created. You know, companies that create maximum number of jobs are closer to the political power in various other countries. And I think that's very, very important for a nation. And I want to go down in history books as that this is the single person who's been able to create you know, 2 million jobs, 5 million jobs, 10 you, million jobs. Rahul Gandhi speaks about a caste census. You speak about a skill census. Is that a difference in approach? Are these just acronyms that... Uh, uh, are great lines uh, to woo uh, public vote and public support. Uh, how do you see? How do you see skill census versus caste census? If you would uh, want to respond to the current political climate as well. See, both are intertwined. We support skill census, but then we need to also back it up with uh, you know a caste census. No second thoughts about it. That way, I'll be able to create a project of practices for every family. Because what's happening is the wealth divide in India is increasingly growing. It's important that the marginalized uh, society is pulled out of the cycle of poverty. That's very, very important. That's where we want to give a project or practice for every family and using technology that we have today on what is the intervention that I can do to pull them out of that cycle. So I believe both are important. No second thoughts about it. But again, I would love for next generation leadership to talk more and actually highlight spearhead creating jobs. But, uh, uh, you know, as far as uh, the government at the center is concerned, caste census is something they've been ambivalent on. Do you think that ambivalence uh, is in sync with uh, your views? These are things that we would discuss across the table. Have they been discussed so far? The conversations are still going on. They have not concluded. And we continue to have conversations around uh, caste census and various other issues. But parallelly, we are also talking uh, to the uh, central government about job creation. Now, that's very, very important for uh, our na an, as a nation. How is it that we're going to create jobs? What are the steps we're going to take for it? And how do we create that kind of a clim clim uh, climate, uh, investor climate to deliver on that promise? So what, is, what has been your sense in terms of the support, ideas uh, that you've been getting from the center? They've been amazingly receptive. Uh, they're open to ideas. They're open to feedback. And they also believe that strong nates, uh, states, strong states make a strong nation. And we believe, uh, together we believe in that and we can deliver on that promise. So have there been any conversations at the level of the Prime Minister, at the level of uh, senior ministers in the government and uh, what are the takeaways? No, various conversations have happened in terms of how do you create jobs, how do you create ecosystem, the role of agriculture in modern India, you know, how do we do skilling. You know, these are conversations that have already happened. And Mr. Naidu has been talking about the four Ps. It's no, no longer about uh, private-public partnership, but we have people there. You know, when we do this project of practices for, for every family, how can we get, uh, you know, the uh, private sector to support, handhold? How do you create this entire ecosystem of, around MSMEs, for an example? And how can you sort of uh, target those particular families and build, uh, bring them out of the cycle of poverty? So these are the ideas we've already exchanged with the Honorable Prime Minister. A lot of people talk about the Praja Darbar that you hold. I, I see a lot of uh, activity by you on social media where, you know, somebody uh, tweets something about, you know, a hospital, the bills, and uh, Nara Lokesh jumps into it, uh, actually guides people. Uh, is, this, is this something that you would usually do, or is it the sign of times where social media um, 
other than trolling can be used for useful activity like reaching the last mile to the people uh, of your state in your case? I mean, if you look at it, some countries use drones to kill people, whilst, you know, India has shown the way that you can use drones for relief activities. So technology has a very, very important role to play in terms of governance. But parallelly, it's important to have the human connect, the touch. That's where I do the Praja Darbar every day when I'm in Amravati between 8 and 9.30 in the morning. Because I get to meet people, I get to understand their issues. I'm able to empathize. Then that goes back into my discussion with my colleagues, then at the cabinet level. So I'm able to appreciate things also far, far better. While AI is here, apps are here, technology is here, I think human connect is equally, if not more important. I've seen this in Padhyatra. In Padhyatra, I used to do a similar session every day, day in, day out. No Saturday, no Sunday break, no festival break. I used to meet people, I used to understand the issues far better. And I wanted to continue that. And Praja Darbar is a way of me continuing that and, remaining gr and remain grounded. Gen next uh, politicians, are they different from gen next uh, otherwise? You know, um, youngsters these days are talking about a work-life balance. Uh, is there some definition of this in politics or is politics literally, uh, you know, your entire life? Well, I've chosen a path, less, less traveled. Uh, I mean, it, it's always been my true calling. I always wanted to serve people. And if I have to serve uh, to the truest extent that I can, then sacrifices have to be made. My family understands it. My son understands it. My wife understands it. And they support me all, all out. So that's why I'm able to do what I was able to do. 226 days of Padhyatra, 3,132 kilometers. Day in, day out, I was with public. I couldn't have done it without the support of my family and my wife and my son. And they continue to support this. And sacrifices have to be made. If you want to go out and achieve uh, you know, great things in any career that you choose, sacrifices are paramount and I believe it's my responsibility now. Uh, but is it an easy price to pay? And, and, and tell, tell me, uh, you know, for youngsters like yourself, younger children, and for the, for the sake of our viewers who want a glimpse into how does a man who's been educated in Stanford wants to get into uh, or actually has gotten into very successfully into Indian politics, does Padhyatras, uh, does uh, uh, even, even these uh, uh, Praja uh, interactions, um, has, has young children, has a modern family, how does he balance all of this? I mean, you need to spend, you need to give time even to your son and rightfully so. I do give time to my son. I do make Lego with him. I spend quality time with him. How old is he? He is now nine years old. Okay. He's in fourth grade. I give him the time, but I would love to give him more time, but it's not possible given where the state is and what I want to achieve. But then I love interacting with him. I keep asking him what he learned in school. What does he think we should do better in the education sector? Okay. Uh, so I love to hear from young kids like him uh, to understand where. So has he already is. given you um, uh, some inputs on what uh, better to do with our uh, schooling systems? Well, today he had a holiday from school and he said uh, if he were the minister, he'll give holidays perpetually. So I said <laughs> that's not going to work, but give me <laughs> constructive advice is what I smokingly uh, told him. But, you know, you learn. I mean, you learn from kids. Uh, so he was the person like earlier when I would drink water. Right? It would be a water bottle. And he, then he counted during COVID and said, so many bottles. And this was when he was five years old. He said, they're all going into the landfill. What are you doing? Why can't we get 20 liter cans at home and actually use uh, drink water? I mean, simple things like that, which would never occur to me. I think this generation is far better than us in terms of environmental responsibility, social sustainability. Responsibility, sustainability. Uh, so I think we have a lot to learn. And I've learned to imbibe that feedback, even coming from a five-year-old back then, now a nine-year-old and his classmates. Amazing. I, I also want to ask you, Nara Lokesh, when uh, in the previous regime, your father uh, was, was in jail, how, how did you handle that uh, particular period of your life and the challenges of that time? See, on one side, uh, I felt let down by the system for the fundamental reason that Mr. Naidu is a person with a very clean track record. He's all, always contributed in the interest of the state and the nation. But on the other side, I mean, the kind of support that he received across states, across nations was amazing. I mean, there was this gratitude concert held in Hyderabad 
where 45,000 IT professionals came together in support of Mr. Knight. And that's what makes all this worth it. We have to go through the test of time and politics. But at the end of the day, uh, the truth will prevail. And that's exactly what has happened uh, in his case. He stood by the people, stood by the nation, and the nation also reciprocated at the right time. What were your conversations with him like at that time? It was extremely challenging, uh, highly emotive. You know, seeing him in that place was something as a family we couldn't take it. Uh, it's it's quite uh, interesting because uh, the first time, because I never went to, never called on anyone in a jail. The first time I went to a mulakat room. It was surreal because uh, the jail was modernized uh, by him during his first term as chief minister. The entire yoga center was done by him as second term as chief minister. The Mulakat block and the entire modern part of the jail was actually built by him as his when he, as third term as chief minister. So even his contribution there was quite visible. It was very surreal that a man who gave so much for his people, for his state, for the nation, had to spend so much time there, and wrongfully so. Political vendetta? Uh, was that the reason and how do you look at uh, vendetta today? Today, uh, will it be that because the TDP is in power, um, it's also, you know, payback time? Well, I think people of Andhra Pradesh felt let down. You know, back then they voted a government that will create jobs. They didn't do that. They went after political enemies. Uh, enemies is a very harsh word because, see, I remember politics of my father where we used to watch the assembly till 2, 3 in the morning, where they would argue, they would debate over an issue, but they would come out and shake hands, have a cup of tea and go home as opponents. But I think that political discourse has disappeared. And that's very unfortunate that I see that, I see that happen in Andhra Pradesh. But people have voted us to create jobs. People have voted us to do good to society. People have voted us to uh, you know, make Andhra Pradesh again number one across all sectors, and we'll go about doing it. But uh, uh, is this only in Andhra Pradesh that you see uh, that political discourse uh, has become rather polarized or do you see it across the board uh, and across the country? We see it uh, in some other states but I think things have moved far and they'll again move back uh, to normalcy. Hopefully next generation leaders you know, will all work together in the interest of our states and the nation. I want to ask you since uh, this entire controversy began from Andhra Pradesh on the Laddu controversy. In hindsight from where we are today do you think you jumped the gun on that entire controversy or will you hold horses? It's an NDDB report. Mr. Naidu received it and Mr. Naidu being a devout Hindu. So there's a lot of emotion also attached to it. In the name of politics, we should not hide facts. It's, it's the responsibility of the government to put facts in front of the public and that's exactly what uh, Mr. Naidu did. More creation, more possibilities. Onto the flight to my dreams, I soar so high with you by my side. I'm floating in the sky. Onto the flight to my dreams, I soar so high with you by my side. Introducing India's first intelligent CUV. The MG Windsor EV Live Business Class. And off we. Hmm. Alu Gobi. Karchi hilana padega. Nahi to jalega. Nahi jalega. Nahi jalega. Sass metal hai. Even heating, no burning. Nahi jalega. Ab jala. Teen layer mein sass metal, stainless steel, aluminium, stainless steel. Matlab even heating, no burning. Vinod Cookware, intelligent cookware. College wale to dosti yaari yaro sang hai freedom sari Freedom equals time of life Life money act joy ride Activa, activa, activa Scooter itli activa Scooter wale to activa Hare, haati liye hai Tadharan water purifier ki maintenance si haati palne se kam nahi Lift your allura Jo deta hai 30 months ki free maintenance warranty Lift your crafted for your well-being
let me also ask you uh, a lot of rhetoric uh, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, conversations in politics uh, revolve around the fact that religion has become center piece of politics i want to ask you since uh, this entire controversy began from andhra pradesh on the laddu controversy the matter is now of course in the supreme court there is an investigation going into it in hindsight from where we are today do you think you jumped the gun on that entire controversy or will you hold horses till uh, the sit or the special investigation team headed by a cbi official uh, comes out with its report i mean if you look at it report is a report it's an nddb report mr naidu received it and mr naidu being a devout hindu and he's born born brought up in chitur his ancestral home overlooks one of the seven hills so there's a lot of emotion also attached to it so when the report came he found it a, that it is his responsibility to put it out in front of the public and that's exactly what he did so i don't think we should hide facts in the name of politics we should not hide facts it's it's a responsibility of the government to put facts in front of the public and that's exactly what uh, mr naidu did and uh, uh, after the uh, hearing in the supreme court and the kind of steps that have been taken are you satisfied uh, with what was brought to light and and the manner in which it is proceeding see sit is there the supreme court added two members of cbi and one expert from fssi to be part of the committee but sit continues so that shows that what the decisions we took were in the right direction and the sit is uh, holds good and they'll go about doing what they have to do and they'll put the report in front of the public and let for me, the public to decide let me let me also ask you uh, about uh, uh, you know your contemporaries in politics what do you think about rahul gandhi and and let's let's do a rapid fire on this what do you think about rahul gandhi no, i think padyatra has definitely changed him okay. uh, but i think still there are certain policies that i don't necessarily agree upon for example and this is a, a conversation we need to continue to have for example which policy no, i think india should not just be about welfare india should be both balancing welfare and development and what i see is a extreme welfareism and not enough of focus coming on development and do you think his targeting of uh, uh, wealth creators uh, you know the manner in which he talks adani ambani all the time do you think uh, that is conducive to the development that you talk about see in of the day there will be companies who will do exceptionally well and they have equal responsibility to do good to society so in the p4 uh, the 4p model or the p4 model uh, that i spoke about that's where we look at entrepreneurs like them to come help give a hand on because they've been lucky society has been kind uh, for them so they should in turn adopt families bring them out of the cycle of poverty but then you need job creators you cannot alienate uh, india's job creators on some pretext or the other so i truly believe that we should celebrate our job creators and we should create next generation of job creators it could be in the msme sector it could be in the startup ecosystem and i think that's going to be very very important for india do you see him as somebody who uh, can lead this country in the future uh, time will only tell your assessment your vision i think it's still too premature for me to come up with an assessment at this juncture what do you think about uh, uh, the strong comeback by the bjp after the recent uh, state elections uh, do you think the congress handed over the victory to the bjp or do you think uh, uh, you know the bjp uh, got its act together uh, after after the lok sabha polls see my understanding is that people want a government that is aligned uh, with the national government number 1 number 2 they want to a government that will create jobs so if you look at uh, states even like orissa today are working exceptionally hard to bring in investments to the state so earlier it used to be all about andhra pradesh now every other state is competing with us so they want a very transparent progressive government that will create the entire ecosystem and jobs and a government that is in alignment uh, with the national government so you are saying a double engine works better than a single engine and is that uh, what people of india think absolutely i mean if you see the kind of mandate that we got in andhra pradesh it's quite clear that people want a double engine sarkar then what about the mandate in telangana in karnataka but they're very few and far in between so let me ask you about other politicians akhilesh yadav what do you think of him 
No, I think he has his right in the I mean, he has mind in the right place. He's done quite a bit of good work for his state, and the elections are going to be up soon. Okay, and what do you think about Mamta Banerjee? Well, she's a she's mother for all of us, so I only have high regards for her. And and the the state of West Bengal, the recent developments in West Bengal, how do you see those? Challenging times. Because see, uh, governments tend to lose uh, sight of what they have to deliver at times, uh, and I think they could have done it uh, a little bit different. But again, this is hindsight. Hindsight. Okay. So let me let me ask uh, about uh, the situation, political situation in Karnataka, controversies, land scams. How how do you see the Congress governments uh, in Telangana and Karnataka? Uh, because you would look at these states very, very closely, given the fact that for, for that slice of investment, uh, they're, they're uh, your competitors. Yes, I'm competing with uh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Telangana, Maharashtra, Orissa, UP, to that matter. So we, we are competing with all the states. Geographically with three. Uh, yeah, but investment, I mean, if you look at any investment today, they're willing to go to any state that, that is going to deliver on the speed of doing business. And there's no second thought about it. And as Andhra Pradesh, we want to be the poster child for it and we want to deliver on our promise. What do you think about populist moves like 75% of the jobs that will be created will be for locals? Uh, many, many states have come up uh, with the, that kind of uh, policy. Do you agree with that? Well, uh, the past government in Andhra Pradesh came up with that policy and it didn't work because it ended up creating no jobs. See, if, a, if an investor is coming and investing in the state, he looks at the human capital in the state. First and foremost, human capital. And once he's satisfied, then he'll look at the government, the speed of governance, the efficacy, and then make the investment. Now, there are areas where I won't have readily available manpower. I'll, I'll give you an example. Electronics manufacturing is a great example of that in Andhra. So, in 2014, we went from zero to manufacturing 25% of India's smartphones. 25%. Now, I, the cutting edge manpower I was able to train, but the managerial, the supervision, I didn't have expertise. I had no experience. So, we had people from Tamil Nadu came. But if you come up with this entire vertical and horizontal reservation and saying, nah, itna rena, then it will impede the growth of the state. And that's what happened. What happened after that from 2019? That 25% went to 5%. And who lost? The state lost. Who gained the neighboring states gain? See, I think we should look at this as a nation and not as purely a state subject, number one. Number two, we have to build ecosystems that make it extremely sticky. So the way we approach uh, the subject in Andhra Pradesh is the entire electronics manufacturing ecosystem should be in 100 kilometer radius. So from your uh, panel manufacturer to your cables, your plastic, your thermocol, cardboard box, the manual printer, everyone should be within the 100 kilometer radius so that uh, you know the entire ecosystem will work and the companies will not only survive but thrive. And this has been the success in different parts of the world. Logistics, ancillaries. Ancillaries, the whole nine yards. If you can do that as a nation and as states, then automatically locals will get jobs. And that's what, you know, Kia, locals are working in Kia. TCL, locals are only working in TCL. So it always happens. So the blueprint is ready. What's, what's uh, Lokesh's agenda for the next 100 days? When we speak 100 days from now, I mean, of course, we can speak before that, but... Uh, uh, 100 days, when we look at the next 100 days, what should you have ticked in the boxes? Well, you will see major announcements coming in terms of investments to Andhra Pradesh. A lot of discussions are at the advanced stages. So we will uh, run faster than we ran in the first 100 days, number one. Number two, in the, uh, the super six promises that we have made, another two promises will get delivered in the next 100 days. Okay, so this seems like a 2020, a Super 6 over coming up uh, uh, in, in these 100 days. Uh, any names that you want to just say and any amounts of investments that you want to talk about that you're looking at? As you said, there's so much of competition, so I won't name any company at this juncture because my competitor will go and poach them. So I'll reserve it and after 100 days, I'll put it out. Fantastic. Now this I call a cutting edge competition and uh, well, you're holding your cards close to your chest. But it's been a pleasure, uh, Lokesh, speaking with you. The first 100 days, extremely eventful. Wishing you all the very best for the next 100 days because by then, 
people will want to see results Absolutely. and uh, this is a generation that is uh, always always in a hurry to look at the results judge people judge governments on governance standards so thank you very much for joining me on frankly speaking and uh, next time i hope uh, you'll uh, unveil some more names so that it will be a very very interesting session speaking frankly on <laughs> issues uh, of andhra pradesh thank, thank you, you very much, much. Thank, thank you very much, much. Thank you.